Hi, my name is Suhaili and welcome to our Curators Tour. We wish that we could meet you in person, but circumstances this year have prevented us from doing so. But don't worry, my colleague Zin and I will be sharing with you more about our current special exhibition titled Orang Banja, Heritage and the Culture of the Banja in Singapore. A number of Banja families in Singapore come from a trading background and many of their forefathers left Martapura or Banjarmasin to seek their fortune abroad as diamond traders. Amongst them were Muhammad Hassan bin Haji Muhammad Saleh and his brother Muhammad Ali who travelled to Singapore in 1926 with seed diamonds given by their mother to start up their diamond business here. Muhammad Ali later relocated to Jakarta to oversee the import and export of raw diamonds while Muhammad Hassan remained in Singapore to take charge of the cutting and polishing of the diamonds and selling them to retailers in Singapore. The diamond trade in Kampung Glam in the early 20th century was significant enough that a Kampung Intan existed near the intersection of today's Busora and Baghdad streets. Ahmad Jamal's business networks included Arab and Jewish gem traders, while his clients included the well-heeled ladies from prominent Arab and Chinese Peranakan families. His workshop was located within his residence at 14 Jalan Pisang, and his business card simply read, Jamal, the jeweler. This gem skill kit, which consists of tiny weights, a scoop and a scale are among the tools of Ahmad Jamal's trade where the value of a stone was measured in points of a carat. His eldest daughter Fauzia recalls how while she was doing her schoolwork in the evenings, she would often observe her father using this gem scale to weigh out the loose diamonds and other gems his clients had selected for the commissioned jewellery. Historically, the island of Borneo is famous for its wide range of precious stones and metals. Other than gold dust, exotic forest products and cultivated pepper, which are mentioned in the Hikayat Banja, diamonds were the Banja Masin Sultanate's most precious exports. As the Dutch established their control of areas of Kalimantan by the 19th century, Banja Masin exported between 25 to 30,000 carats of diamonds between 1836 and 1880. Many of these diamonds were traded on the international diamond market in Europe and sizable, exquisitely cut diamonds of rare beauty have been presented to Dutch royalty as gifts from the colonies. Amongst the most intriguing Kalimantan diamonds is the Banja Masin diamond, which is first described in a Dutch account in 1857, after an expedition to Borneo in 1836 found its travellers in Banjarmasin before Sultan Pananlika Adam was adorned in silks, golds and diamonds. The most striking, a 77 carat uncut octahedron diamond pendant hung simply by a string around his neck. Dramatically, it was later seized along with the rest of the Sultan's treasury when the Sultanate was dissolved by the Dutch following civil war after the Sultan's death in 1859. Upon its arrival in Rotterdam in 1862, the diamond acquired the moniker the Banja Masin, but curiously weighed seven carats lighter. Even more curiously, the board of directors of the Natural History Museum in Leiden, where it was intended to go, decided not to accept the gift, and the colonial government then decided to put up the diamond for sale after it was cut into a more affordable 40 carat modified cushion cut, more suited to European taste. Despite all the hullabaloo the diamond generated, it only finally went on public display for the first time in 1902 at the Rijksmuseum, together with jewellery seized by the Dutch from the Raja of Lombok at the end of the 19th century. The Banja Masin's next public appearance was in Paris in 2001. It has been on display in the Rijksmuseum since, where a caption acknowledges its problematic provenance as war booty. This replica on display 
was a collaboration between MHC and Rijksmuseum, in which the Rijksmuseum shared with us the GEMS characteristics and high-resolution perspectival images, which we then commissioned the GEM Museum in Singapore to source for a similar, the more affordable natural stone to cut into the replica. The expert at the GEM Museum selected a white quartz from Africa and was fashioned by a diamond cutter in Amsterdam into this brilliant gem that you see on display. The skill of the cutter is evident from how he was able to coax out the stone's best qualities even as he stayed true to the Banjamasin's historical form. Throughout our conversations with the Banja community, it was clear that they pride upon the projection of their cultural history as a main pillar of their identity. This rich tapestry includes how religion, language and social gatherings constantly infuse throughout history to highlight how the Banja view their social landscape, how they choose to reconstruct their memories and hence to bring out what it means to be Banja. Ethnographers have long argued that the term Banja refers to a few binding elements that glue the disparate communities of South Kalimantan together rather than a specific ethnic group. One of these binding elements is Islam and its deep-seated importance in the Banja community. One of the ways in which the Islamic aspect of Banjari's identity is manifested is through the reverence of prominent religious figures like Sheikh Ashad al-Banjari and Haji Muhammad Zaini Abdul Ghani, also known as Guru Ijai. Born in South Kalimantan, the career paths and the intellectual legacies of these gurus inspire many generations after them. In Singapore today, members of the Banja community still speak fondly of them. Here at the exhibition, this reverence towards religious figures is showcased through the myriad of images of community members with religious gurus, or frames of religious gurus themselves. Such an exhibition design was only done so because throughout our research, we found out that the Banjat would personally dedicate a space in their homes to have pictures of these gurus hung out of respect and remembrance. Additionally, all community members have offered physical artifacts that highlight how the Banja community has contributed to the religious, intellectual landscape in Singapore and the region. If you head down to the exhibition, you will witness a few publications written by Banja religious gurus. One of these publications details the genealogy of Sheikh Ashad al-Banjari's descendants. On loan to us from the descendant of Haji Mahmud, Muhammad Ghazali Arshad, this publication is undoubtedly very detailed, listing down his lineage from as early as 1700s. Such a collection underscores the dedication and enthusiasm that the global Banja community has towards these figures. Amazingly, this dedication has translated into a form of Banja cultural identity. In recent years, some Banjas have also participated in international religious events. In Martapura, the birthplace of prominent religious gurus like Sheikh Arshad himself and Guru Ijai. However, What's interesting is that these mini pilgrimages also sees them gather to meet their relatives across the Nusantara. These yearly big regional meetups with relatives is affectionately known as Aruganal. In Basa Banjar or Banjaris language, Arugana refers to a major gathering. One of the biggest Aruganal in recent times occurred in March 2020 during an international festival called Aruganal Budaya Banjar. Organised by the Banja community of East Kalimantan, it attracted Banja communities across the region, including Singapore, the Philippines and Thailand, who came together to celebrate their history and culture. This exhibition thus features the various efforts by members of the Banja community to organise such community gatherings over the years, a practice that has persisted across generations of Banja families from Kalimantan to Singapore and through their various migratory phases across the Nusantara. In Singapore, one of the places where such social gatherings would occur is at Lorong Marikan, located at Kembangan Precinct, bounded by Sims Avenue and Jalan Yunus. 
This locale was where Ghazali Arshad and his family lived. This fond memory is evidenced by these house models. Ghazali, a descendant of the Banja diamond industry pioneer Haji Mahmud, and nephew to Haji Muhammad Sanusi, the first Mufti of Singapore, constructed a model of his childhood home, a rumah panggung or raised house on pillars from memory. In addition, he also reconstructed his uncle's house. He did so as a means of giving form to his memories, a firm assertion of how Lorong Marikan was once a place of social unison and retrospect. Accompanying these house models are images of Ghazali's family and his relatives as they gather in this locale. It can thus be said that social gatherings are an important feature of the Banja community as they reaffirm a spirit of togetherness and allow for the renewal of ties amongst distant relatives and extended family members. More importantly, such a practice has grown into some form of Banja cultural identity, an aspect they would affectionately share if you happen to chance upon a meeting with them in these galleries. Traditional Banja weddings provide a display of the community's values and culture. Large events that sometimes span across more than one city, weddings provide an opportunity for family members from both nearby and afar together. Marriages are also more generally seen as a means of ensuring the continual passing down of Banja heritage and culture. In fact, it was not uncommon to arrange marriages between the members of the Urang Banja community, as was the case with several of our community contributors and their families. In the tail end of your visit in Gallery 2, you will be greeted with a display of artefacts that celebrate this aspect of Banja culture, hallmarked by a large 3 meter wide display of a wedding textile known as Arguchi or Ayirguchi. This type of textile is distinguished by its technique of embroidering screen pieces to create decorative landscapes. This particular textile consists of various vegetal motifs that center upon a pineapple or nanas. This would be used as the backdrop of the newlyweds wedding dais to signify their devotion to God. Each textile would take several weeks to produce and its laborious nature often meant that families would rent or loan Arguchi textiles to each other. The practice of using plastic sequin pieces on these Arguchi textiles is said to have originated from a merchant who had travelled from Singapore to South Kalimantan in the early 20th century. Prior to this, these textiles were only ever made with brass pieces, which were costlier and heavier as well. Further down this display is a rounded wooden vessel known as a pankin, loaned to us by Mr. Latif Omar, who recalls inheriting this pankin from his grandmother. It was used to store her wedding clothes and the pankin's oblong shape is said to have been able to prevent folds and creases from forming on one's clothes. One could imagine that this would have been particularly useful when traveling or passing down one's wedding clothes to the next generation. Two key characteristics of the journey stories of the Urang Banjar community in Singapore. We have come to the end of the curator's tour. We hope that you have enjoyed the bites of information that we have shared with you. In order to fully experience the wealth of this Banjaris culture, what are you waiting for? Head down to the Malay Heritage Centre as soon as you can. Take care.